So dear attendees, I'm more than happy to see so many people. Oh, okay, okay, just kidding. It's the end of the. It's the end. <laughs> it's the end of Vision Golf. So I guess that uh, the guys who are here are the most motivated. Uh, so I'm more than happy to moderate the last panel of this first Vision Golf, brilliantly organized by uh, by Business France. The last panel is simply named Mega Project That Shapes the GCC. Actually, it would have been the main theme of this today event. Uh, for people who know a little bit the GCC region, the main characteristic to describe its economic blast is um, Mega or Giga. We love to uh, we love to use those, those kind of uh, those kind of words when we when we when we live in the Gulf. Uh, I, I used to live there during the five past years, and uh, yes, the term Giga. Mega, and we should even invent a, a bigger word. So, um, so maybe one day, yes, we will find another big word, a bigger word to talk about the ambition of the region. But let's stay focused on the expression "mega project." GCC is indeed the world region where the the announcement of giga project is the most frequent. You cannot open a local newspaper, and I'm well placed because I, I often write in uh, Arab news. Um, without, um, without reading about one of the mega or giga project planned or, or under process uh, in the region. During the five past years, I used to be the dean of the French Arabian Business School in the Kingdom of Bahrain, um, adding the MBA and the executive MBA on, uh, on behalf of ESSEC Business School, very well known uh, business school. Last year, I have been recruited by Schema, another one. It's a bit less ranked, but okay. Uh, to to be the, the dean of the Master of Science named Program and Project Management and Business Development. So it completely sticks with the um, with, with with the team of the the, the main team of this uh, of this one table. And to be honest, my students are trained to be part of this kind of project. Uh, many of them are directly contacted by the companies operating in the Gulf uh, for PMO, uh, project management uh, officer positions, or by consulting companies um, working directly for the projects. Therefore, I can testify that the business run projects in the GCC is vibrant and very attractive. So today I propose to see two aspects of the mega projects with the guests of the panel. First, Charles-Emmanuel uh, Charles de Beauregard, head of CIB at uh, Qatar National Bank is the best place to talk about the very important subject of financing those projects and the way investors and contractors should position themselves on these opportunities. QNB is the bank of many mega or giga projects in the GCC, and I am more than certain that, that Charlie Emmanuel has some experience to share with us. Our guest in intervenes during the next step of the project. Once at least part of the money is there. He represents the French expertise is one in one of the five Saudi Giga project that, uh, that are supposed to be the drivers of the Vision 2030 strategic plan of the kingdom, kingdom of Saudi Arabia, of course. I am sure that Nicolas Lefebvre, head of uh, tourism and hospitality at uh, Agence Française for Alula, will explain us how it is to be an actor of a project that is actually reshaping a world country, and what are the non-visible challenges and the side effects of such a job? The aim of this panel is first that at the end, the participants, yourselves, and I'm sure that you are highly motivated, of course, um, have some keys to check whether the project they are looking at is mature or not. Second, the participants will have a clear view on what kind of business could be done with the mega projects in the Gulf. From my side, I will try to challenge my two speakers by asking them if they can identify in what extent those projects are shaping the Gulf. Obviously, they are physically shaping the landscape. Uh, Lusail City in Qatar, Diria in Saudi Arabia, or Mohammed bin Rashid Solar Park in Dubai will be visible and remarked by the visitors. But those projects will not only shape the Gulf physically. They are part of a wider vision, a wider development plan that is supposed to embed the world population. To increase the global level and the human capital of the, country, of the countries. The amount of investment requested to launch, run, and achieve such projects entails many other aspects than just construction fees. What I often say to my students is that what defines a project is that there is a beginning, there is a running of this project, and there is an 
end of the project. And it is the most important thing when you want to, uh, to manage things uh, based on project, you always, have to, you always have to think about the ending of the project. There is a timeline and at the end of this timeline, it has to be delivered. The Gulf region is engaged is a wide shift to prepare the, to prepare the, the post oil era. The shift is full of projects, but those projects are very often part of large scale events or wider plan. Lusail City, for example, in Qatar wouldn't have been achieved without the perspective of the FIFA World Cup in Qatar. And we can imagine that if, and inshallah, they will get it, KSA gets the organization of the Expo uh, 2030, it will boost many projects. Therefore, the shaping action of those projects has to be conceived through specific and different prisms we will have to decode. So first, Charles-Emmanuel de Beauregard, can you introduce yourself and, and your role in, in a few words? Arnaud, uh, thanks a lot for this introduction. It's a pleasure for me to be uh, with you uh, this afternoon. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, this topic of a mega project is a very, very important one for the region and for, for us as well uh, here in Europe. Um, so my name is uh, Charles Emmanuel de Bourgard. Um, I uh, work for Qatar National Bank. Uh, I am uh, very lucky to be the head of uh, uh, the team in charge of a relationship with uh, corporate and financial institutions here in Europe. Um, previously, I worked in, in, in the Gulf for six years, which is an experience which I really appreciated. And I can really see that the, the region is uh, changing uh, extremely uh, quickly at the moment. Just a few words, if I may, uh, on, on QNB. Uh, as of today, we are the largest bank uh, in, in Africa and in, in, in the Middle East. Uh, we are, um, uh, at the moment, um, at a level in terms of uh, market cap, which is uh, higher than some of uh, uh, big uh, European banks. Uh, and we are increasing, increasingly active, sorry, uh, in, um, as, a, as, a, as a, I would say, key player in the relationship not only between France and Qatar, of course, I mean, we, uh, we were established in, in, in France in the, in the 70s, uh, but our uh, mandate, our mission, our willingness is, of course, to uh, support this very close uh, uh, french qatari relationship, but more broadly to be a, a gateway uh, between the Middle East and Europe, uh, especially uh, at a moment where there is a, a lot at stake uh, between these two geographies, especially on the, uh, on the energy side. So um, uh, QNB is a, a very well-capitalized bank with a, a strong willingness to play a, a, a big role in this uh, initiative. And that's why we've been uh, extremely uh, active over the last few uh, years in, in, in supporting this, uh, this relationship. And I hope we will uh, elaborate a little bit on this kind of relationship uh, a little bit after this, uh, uh, a little bit further. And you, Nicolas Lefebvre, can you just introduce the role you are playing into one of the most remark remarkable uh, Saudi Giga project? Yes, pleasure. Thank you, Arno, and good evening. Good afternoon, better say, uh, to all of you. Um, yes, I, I will come back to me in a few minutes, but I need, Arno, to begin with Afarullah, because you mentioned this project called Afarullah in the northwest part of Saudi Arabia. And, and there is this French agency with something strange in a way to see what, 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 is, this, what is this French agency doing with one of the mega projects in Saudi Arabia. And so uh, Afarula, as we call it, the French agency for Alula, was born five years ago, further to a state agreement between the two countries, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia on one side and the, and the France on the other side. Where, where they decided to build a cooperation, a very dedicated cooperation to this specific project of Alula, which is a tourism development. I will come back to that, of course, in a, in a minute. Uh, and further to this agreement, which was signed in Paris in April 2018, the French government set up this agency called Afalula uh, with the aim for us to be the, the French part implementing this agreement. So we are now a, a, a team of 50 people, so still a rather uh, limited uh, agency in terms of staff, number of staff. But which is impress a very impressive as agency, it's a, it's a collection of very, very different expertise, know-how, 
uh, and people coming from very different fields, because we are supposed to work on every aspect of the project, not only tourism, which is my, my case, but also very, very other aspects, I will come back to, 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 to that. We have two missions, mainly, for Afalula, working closely with our uh, Saudi partner, which is a Royal Commission for Alula. The first one, of course, is to co-develop co co the Alula project in close cooperation uh, as a French partner to our Saudi colleague, which is a Royal Commission for Alula. And the second one is to bring and infuse French expertise and know-how in the project. And of course, for the benefit of the project, of course. Um, coming to, to, to me very quickly now, I don't know if I, if I may, so uh, within this team I just described very quickly, I am the one in charge of tourism and hospitality, which is one part of the project. As I said, it's in, in a way a very important part because the goal of Alula is to develop a tourist destination, but there is a lot of other uh, skills and aspects which are developed at the, at the, at the main time. So, for, for as far as I'm concerned, there were two main aspects, two main areas for me. The one, the first one is de destination marketing. So, I work closely with the team in charge of making that this new destination is well known and well promoted all around the world. And the second is to contribute to the development of a tourist offer. Because, of course, there is no destination without a specific tourist offer which has to be developed. And so, if, to make it very short, I would say my role is to contribute to make sure that this amazing place called Alula will become in the future a very well-known and attractive tourist destination in the world. Uh, and, and, and known, of course, around the world as a uh, sustainable, uh, desirable uh, tourist destination. Right, I, I completely got this point, and uh, I'm very rich to have such a panel. We are not very, uh, we are not too many people uh, around the table, but at least there is the, the, the there is the guy who operates, and the guy is the guy who is supposed to to fund and to find some way to finance those uh, those projects. And so, Charlie Emmanuel, what is the role of a bank such as QNB in the funding of those projects? What are the criteria used to decide to uh, to give some money or not to give some money? Uh, I think that many of many people are interested uh, are interested in how can you take money from QNB? So, c can you explain us? Okay. So, thank you very much, Arnaud, for this uh, very straightforward question. It's an important one. Um, if you allow me, I would like to take a, a few minutes on uh, what is the, uh, the, the current financial standing of a region by making a bit of a history. Uh, I think it is really, really important for everyone to understand that uh, oil and gas are generating circa 80-90% of the revenues of these countries. And so, uh, in terms of financial means, all these countries are very, very dependent on the price of oil and gas. Uh, everything uh, was going very smoothly until, uh, until uh, 2014, when uh, I would say all of a sudden, oil and gas went down sharply. Let's not forget that uh, a few years back, the, uh, the price of oil on the forward market was below zero, below zero. So it means that producers, had to pay not on the spot, but on the forward market, I had to pay for people to buy their oil. That was the reality. And this led to a um, very large budget deficit for these countries, the first of which being Saudi Arabia. And all of a sudden, Saudi Arabia, but that was also the case for the UAE, for Kuwait, for Qatar, and so on, had to face a massive uh, budget deficit uh, compared to, to their size. Um, I must say that uh, these countries have been extremely reactive in addressing the situation. Just as an anecdote, some of these countries did not have any department in charge of, in charge of managing the debt simply because there was no debt. I mean, for us, French, it would be a dream come true. There was no debt at all because they were running on budget surpluses. So they created these offices in an in emergency and they were able to very quickly uh, to tap the bank market, the bond market. They did also a lot of ECA financing to uh, finance a large uh, project. And, and, and frankly, congratulations to them because they were very uh, uh, fast and agile in, 
in doing so. Uh, at that time, of course, the uh, banks from the GCC were impacted in terms of their ability to uh, finance this large project precisely because a lot of this liquidity was used by the sovereign and it is a time where a lot of uh, international banks uh, established or strengthened their presence in the Middle East to support this project. Um, all the GCC countries are also, of course, very uh, conscious that they need to diversify and this situation uh, led them to accelerate this, uh, this uh, large uh, infrastructure uh, project. Where are we at the moment? The, the, the situation has changed quite a lot, simply because uh, the price of oil and gas has gone up again. Just as an illustration, uh, last year, uh, Qatar uh, due to the price of gas has uh, generated a, a budget uh, excess which is estimated to be 25 billion US dollar for a, a small country. Uh, as far as other countries are concerned, well, it depends, of course, but their financial situation now is certainly much better than what it was uh, two or three uh, years ago. And um, this has uh, also uh, proven to be uh, the case as well for uh, banks from the GCC, which are, uh, I would say, completely uh, contracyclical. If you look at the macro aspect of things, you know that uh, the quantitative easing is over, so there is less liquidity in the international market, and international banks have a, 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 a more difficult access, or I should say a less easy access to uh, liquidity, and therefore they are probably less keen to employ or deploy this liquidity uh, for a project in the Middle East, whereas to the contrary, GCC banks, first of which being QNB, are becoming liquid, uh, very liquid again at a moment where uh, the, the sovereign countries need this liquidity to, uh, to finance the, uh, the project. So it was a very long uh, answer to your short question, but basically there are more and more uh, projects in the regions. These are absolutely uh, strategic uh, to achieve this diversification, and QNB as an institution is extremely keen to support this project uh, if they are uh, strategic for these countries, and uh, to all possible extent, if they have also a strong uh, uh, um, uh, uh, angle with respect to uh, facilitating the energy transition. Okay, it was it was really important to mention this uh, this macroeconomic indicators because um, since the beginning of the of the of this vision golf, we are talking about uh, about sectors, about uh, about microeconomic things, and it was really important to have this uh, this macroeconomic view. So thank you very much. Um, at the very beginning of my of my, of my speech, uh, I was uh, I was telling that um, I, I was saying that uh, that Giga proje projects are reshaping, and it's the actually it's the it's the title of the of the of this ta of this round table, reshaping shaping the GCC. Um, Nicola, uh, can you elaborate a little bit on it? In what extent the Giga projects you know, and especially the one you you are working for, are shaping the country and at a wider scale all the GCC, all the region? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to, to give you some hints on that. First, maybe uh, I need to mention what, what, what are we calling the mega project or gear projects, speaking of, of KSA. There is other, as you mentioned, other, other part of the GCC, but if we focus on, on KSA for, for the moment. So usually we are talking of Diri Gate, which is a large development project in Riyadh, in the western part of Riyadh. We are talking of Kia, which is a huge amusement park, a leisure park, built 100 kilometers uh, west of Riyadh. We are talking of the two main projects uh, on the Red Sea. The one is called Red Sea, by the way, uh, and the other one is Neom, so the, the, the city for the future in the, the northwest part of, of, uh, of Saudi Arabia, close to the Aqaba Gulf and the, and the Red Sea. And, and the last one among the five I want to mention is, of course, Alula, uh, the, 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 the very well known of, of, uh, of Alula. And for sure, I fully agree with you and with the title of this uh, roundtable today, uh, for sure these projects are, are part of a big transformation plan for the, for the country, for, for KSA at least. 
So I, I think this is a, the way we need to see that. At the very beginning, there is this vision 2030. And this plan is really a big transformation plan for KSA. Having to, to, to say with the economy, of course, diversification of the economy, leaving oil and gas to go to other, uh, diversification to other uh, economic, but it's also a big trans transformation plan for the society itself and also for the nation. And we can see very recently all the moves made by the Crown Prince in KC in the geopolitics of the region. It's very impressive. So it's, all, it's very at the level that we need to see that. And the pr projects we are, we are talking about today, this afternoon, are a part of this, are part of this. And they will reshape exactly uh, the, 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 the country in, 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 in according to this uh, plan I just mentioned, Vision 2030. Speaking of Alula, the one I, I know the best, of course, uh, it's important to say that Alula is far more than just developing a tourist destination. Of course, if you look at what is the aim of that, they will say, we are going to build and develop there one of the most important uh, tourist destination for, for the Middle East in the future. But in fact, it's far, far more than that. This project will totally transform this region. The first thing to mention is that this region of Alula is the size of a country. It's not only the little city of Alula and, and the suburbs around. It's the size of a, of a country. It's 23,000 square kilometers. So it's a size, to give you an idea, it's the size of Slovenia, the size of the region Lorraine in France, or the size of Tuscany in Italy, to give you an, just a, an idea. And all what is in progress at the moment will reshape this region totally. To give you some example, the population, which is about 40, 50, 7 people at the moment, the population will triple in the coming 15 years. The, we are going to build a lot of assets in all the different aspects of the life of people, infrastructure, power, water, waste, transportation, education, of course, agriculture, culture. So this will for sure transform, and we can already see that. When you go to Alula at the moment, the, the, as I said previously, the project began five years ago. But you can see, even now, even now, five years later, you can see the changes already. You can see in the old town, this was an, 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 an abandoned city four years ago. Now, you, when you can walk there, there is a very nice uh, street with shops, with restaurants, and you can see, which is more, more important, you can see tourists, of course, a few tourists, but you can see the local people walking, the family walking and sitting at the terrace and a cafe or a restaurant. This didn't exist before in Alula. It was impossible to see that. And just four, three or four years later, you can, you can see that. Just an example of what is the, the change in, in, in progress. And uh, one of the mo mo most important as aspects of that is, of course, young people. As you know, this country is a very, very young people. Nothing to do with, with what we are in, in the old Europe. Very different. And uh, we can see that young people, of course, this is, this is done mainly for them. This transformation is done by a young man, by the way, the crown prince, for the younger people in this country, which are two-thirds of the population. And they are going to train most of them to prepare them to be able to hold all the new jobs in progress, in progress at the moment, in the new activities, especially tourism, but, but not only tourism. And the other aspect I want to mention to, to, uh, to try to answer your question, uh, Arno, is that it's also for women. And it's very impressive to see already now how many new jobs are held by women at the moment. I want just to, to tell you just an anecdote, as you, as you said, a very different one from yours, Sean, but, but, but uh, yes. They decided, it, I think it was two years ago in, in KSA, which was very, very surprising for us, for you know, people from the tourism. It was very, very stunning to see that. They decided in, in one night that at the desk of the hotel, we should see only Saudi people. Before, before that, of course, all hospitality in KSA was held by people from outside, from, from expats working from space, coming from Asia or Europe or different parts of the world. They decided in one night that now we need to have Saudi people at the desk when you, when you arrive. In the, and this was, you can, you can guess, 
it was a mess. It was awful, you know, to, to, it's impossible to do for auto operators to change uh, so many people in one night or in one week. So it was very difficult. I remember I arrived in some hotels, it was very difficult. You, you find very nice people in front of you, but unable to answer your questions or unable to do anything. But they were, they were Saudi, they, they, they were Saudi, uh, very different from what happened before. And finally, they were able to, to train them, and now it's, the, the, the situation is far, far better now, after a few months. But one of the impact of that, the very impressive consequence of that, is that now you have women in the hotels. It never happened before. You were always in front of men before. And now, very often, you have Saudi women in front of you. And this is an, an, an example of the changes uh, what are happening now in the, in the, in the country. Uh, exactly. It was, it, it was a thing that surprised me a lot. I, I come very often in, in Saudi, of course, and every time I come back, I stay at the, every, every time I stay at the, at the same hotel, and from yes, from one day to, to, to the next one, uh, all the sorry, all the uh, Indian or Asian people uh, uh, at the desk disappeared and were replaced by Saudi uh, Saudi ladies. The service is excellent, by the way. But uh, yes, it's it's uh, for for a Westerner like me, for visitors, it was uh, it was really, really surprising, and it shows something. It shows something. It's not only it's a, it's a, it's an actual consequence of the project. Uh, of course, it's the vision, but the vision is uh, is embedded into the project. And by the way, uh, when I used to live in Saudi or in uh, or in Bahrain. Um, every time I was opening a, a newspaper, I was, oh, this time we are going to build a metro in Manama, Bahrain. We are going to build a new airport. We are going to build a new bridge between uh, Qatar and, uh, and Bahrain, etc., etc. And so there are many, many, many uh, different projects announced. Um, Charles Emmanuel, the announcement of new projects are kind of very usual things in the Gulf. Uh, it's kind of uh, in nearly. Um, of national marketing, let's say this. What are the tips you can give us to know which ones are the most likely to be achieved quickly and to be delivered, uh, to be to, 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 to be delivered at a, at a fast uh, at a fast uh, pace? Well, I would love to have a tip. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Ah, you are the one with the money, so <laughs> you are supposed to know. <laughs> no, but uh, I would like to put things into uh, perspective. Uh, indeed, uh, there's a lot happening in the region. Uh, with a lot of projects announced, and they are not small ones. If you uh, look at on a combined basis, there's something like maybe 800, 900 billion worth of projects which have been officially announced in the GCC, with a very, very significant share in the, uh, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, the key question here, as you rightly say, Who's going to pay for that? Who's going to pay for that? Uh, and I would like just to, 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 to take a, an example, a non-controversial one, but this just to, to, again, to put things into perspective. When Neom was announced, it was announced for a total amount of 500 billion. Um, the current FX reserves of uh, the SAMA, which is the Central Bank of Saudi Arabia, is 400 billion. Is Saudi Arabia going to finance this project on its own? The answer is no. And they have been extremely clear about it. They will need money for this specific project and for others. Um, it's really a question of, I would say, uh, amount and timing, because uh, the, the, the two aspects uh, go uh, together. Um, I don't want to... Uh, to, to, to spend too much time on, on figures, but typically when you do a project financing, you need to put at least 20 to 30% of equity, and the rest is coming from financing. Uh, so 800, 9, 9 billion, 900 billion worth of projects, if, if they are not funded by the budget, and they can't be funded by the budget, will have to be funded by uh, investors on the equity side. And this means theoretically 150, 200, 250 billion worth of equity. This is absolutely massive. Uh, it was interesting to, uh, to hear uh, Bruno Le Maire uh, yesterday 
talking about this Choose France event, which took place last year, where France was very happy to uh, report that uh, there was 11 billion of uh, uh, foreign direct investment announced for France. GCC on a combined basis in, in terms of population is, is less than France. If you take uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, and so on and so on. So it means that for this project, the region would need to attract 20 times, 20 times the amount of uh, foreign investment that uh, France has been able to uh, achieve through this event last year. So this is the, quick question, the, the key question. Where is the equity going to come from? In my opinion, it will have to come from the uh, local authorities for some part. They need to find external investors. It is really important to realize that we are in a world that where there is an increasing competition on attracting uh, direct investment. So if today I am an equity investor, I am extremely solicited. So why should I put my money in the GCC as opposed to Asia, as opposed to the United States or wherever? So this is really what is at stake at the moment. And here I'm talking just about the equity side of the, the financing. Uh, now, on the debt side, which is our role as a bank, uh, as I said earlier on, there is liquidity available, for sure. Uh, international banks continue to be uh, extremely uh, supportive of some of these uh, of these uh, of these projects, maybe a less uh, a bit less now on the uh, oil and gas side for, for for some reasons, but they understand this willingness of the Gulf to uh, uh, develop uh, infrastructure to diversify and so on. So they are still very active, and the, uh, the banks from the GCC like us are uh, really back in the game to uh, to support, but. To me, it's really a, a, a matter of understanding what is the timing for this project, because if you look at only the figures, uh, not everything will be, uh, will be uh, doable uh, in a very short time frame. For sure. And actually, um, regarding, the, regarding this uh, timetable, you cannot think, you cannot, uh, yes, you can conceive this project such as normal projects with an official timeline, etc. You have to uh, you, you have to forecast some delays, but but as I said, a project is defined by the beginning and the end and the delivery. And hey, we can say whatever we want, but those projects at the end of the day they are delivered. Maybe the date is not exactly the forecasted one, but uh, I don't know. Uh, I, there are not that many uh, cancelled projects. So at the end, they are achieved. And this is and uh, and and really what you said is really important. Um, we have to find the the ways. So it's on the speech of the of the of the deciders, of the rulers, of the the where the, where does the investors are coming from, etc. But at the at the end of the day, those projects will be delivered. Um, Another another thing, Nicola, because um, you were mentioning the role of uh, of women, etc. I think that the, the French expertise goes far beyond just tourism and hospitality. If I tell you that Giga projects are transforming the population of the Gulf countries by increasing the human capital, uh, do you think it is true? And do you have any uh, any any examples of uh, of trainings uh, organized by uh, by Afalula, for example? Uh, yes, uh, yes, of course. Thank you, uh, Arno. Uh, yes, uh, as I said, I think it's very important to taking the example of Alula once more because it's the one I, I, I know best, of course. Uh, as I said before, we need to have in mind that Alula is, is a ho holistic project in a way, involving all type of expertise and being a regional development project, not not only not only a tourism uh, project. And that's why, speaking, coming back to, uh, to Afalula and the, the expertise we bring to the project as, as the French agency, we are, Afalula is much more than just a tourism development agency. We, 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 you can see that in every, every country, but they, we are far, far more different than, with that. With a small agency, as I said, but with a lot of expertise in the different fields. And for example, we have, to give you just an example, we have, we have a very important archaeological sector, for example. Alula, I'm glad to say, to say that to you, Alula at the moment is one of the major places in the world for archaeology. 
There is 150 archaeologists working at that moment in Alula. And this is one of the first places in the world for archaeology. And by the way, it's very inspiring also if you think of this country. This country is, is doing to, to do at the moment a huge effort on his own history. He is rediscovering the history of that part of the world, which was very much unknown until very recently. And I want to mention that, by, 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 by the way. And so coming back to your question of, of human capital, this is the case with, with archaeology. This is the case with tourism, of course. But this is also with other aspects, like infrastructure, like agriculture. Because agriculture, as you, as you, as you guess, is at the moment one of the major economic activity in Alula. It's a very rural. Alula has nothing to do with oil and gas. There's no oil, no gas, nothing at, at, this, at this place. But it's an amazing palm tree, uh, oasis. It has been an oasis for millennia and millennia, for more than 10,000 years uh, before. And so agriculture is for sure one of the main uh, activity at the moment. And one of the goals of the project is, is to, to make sure that this agriculture will remain. remain. We don't need to, to destroy agriculture to replace it by tourism. By, because one of the reasons for that is that the value of tourism is linked to that. If we destroy agriculture, we will destroy tourism at the same time. So it's very important. And this needs also a lot of development of human, human capital. To give you just a few examples, speaking of Alula, so the Royal Commission developed from the very beginning, it was five years ago, a scholarship program making that every year they send 300 young people abroad in different countries, US, UK, France, to train them. The first thing to, to, to make that they were able to learn foreign languages, so mainly English and French. And then for them to have studies in these different countries to learn the new skill they need for the new economy of Alula, meaning tourism, hospitality, agriculture, uh, archaeology, I mentioned, and, 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 and some, some others. Another example we are developing at the moment, it's a, it's a close cooperation between the RCU and Afalula, we are developing what we call the International College for Tourism and Hospitality, which will become one of the main uh, tourism school in the kingdom in the, in the coming years. And we are very proud of that. And with a French, by the way, with a French partner, which is Ferrandi Paris, the very well-known Carolinian arts uh, school, you, you probably heard of, uh, of it. And another example, very quickly, I want to mention is Madrasat Adira. It's, a, it's an, an old school in Alula, which was transformed recently into a school dedicated to women from Alula. And for them, to learn all the ancient techniques in crafts and arts and crafts. And you have dozens of women uh, trained and learning all these techniques to be able to have new activities in connection with tourism, of course, as you may, may guess. Perfect. We have two minutes and a half left because uh, the, the attendant doesn't know it, but I have a, I have a, I have a clock here. So I'm I'm becoming a little bit nervous. Uh, no, uh, the good news is that um, there were a few people at the beginning and the number of attendees is, uh, is increasing. So, so it's, the, it's the time for, to ask you the last question in, a, in just one word. Uh, so the replies have to be, have to be very, very quick, but uh, as there are many people, I'm sure that they, are very, uh, that would, they would be very interested in, uh, in investing or in being partners of such uh, GIGA projects. Charles Emmanuel, I'm sure that, uh, that the people in the audience would love to, uh, to hear for your main recommendation uh, how, to, uh, how to invest uh, safely. Well, of course, uh, asking this question to a banker is not, uh, is not very, but uh, what is, what is your, your recommendation to the, uh, to, to the, uh, to the attendees, to, 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 to the audience? Uh, some of them maybe want to invest. Um, what can you... Uh, Give you a comment as well as advice. Uh, uh, again, I, I believe this, this region is extremely exciting precisely because there are uh, so many interesting projects and this project makes, makes sense. And the region also has a, a, a strong record, a track record, sorry, in delivering on this project. Oil and gas, power, water, I mean, they, they, they have been used to, uh, to, to, to do this project for, for decades. What is new now is that we're seeing a, a project uh, in the cultural space, uh, sports related, like the, the, the World Cup, the new cities like uh, Luzel, Mazdar, and so on. And all of these projects uh, 
have been achieved on time uh, have proven to be extremely successful. And why that? Because there, is, there was and there is still a strong willingness to see this project happening. And that's why it's really important for, for all of us to try and understand among this, this very long list of projects what are the must-have versus the nice-to-have. And this is not an, a, a, an easy thing to do. And that's why the proximity with the decision makers, uh, with the people who want to, this project to happen, is absolutely key. So it's the, I would say, most important uh, question to, uh, to, to, to ask. And we, uh, uh, as QNB, and I'm sure it's true for other banks, we are happy to have this dialogue with you because we also have access to the people who can uh, answer this, uh, this very important uh, question. Okay, the clock tell, tells me that now the time is over, but really a last question for you, uh, Nicola, because uh, I'm sure that uh, around this, uh, this audience, People would love to uh, to work for such projects. To and I am the first one to. Uh, I, I would love to uh, to be a partner of Alula, for example. How can we do this? Yeah, yeah, of, of course. Uh, and and I can tell you there is there is room enough for French companies in Alula for sure. To give you a few few num few, few figures to judge very very quickly. From the beginning, so it was five as I said five years ago. From we already had. 250 contracts signed with French companies in Alula. And this, this represents 180 French companies who signed contracts. And most of them, two thirds of them, are small companies, are SMEs. Not, not only, of course, we have some big names. We have Wig, we have Accor, we have Thales, we have RATP Dev, and others. But we have also two thirds of them which are small and small SMEs. Um, let me let me may, maybe to 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 conclude uh, for for my side I would give you a few recommendations to 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 you who are interested in developing your business in in uh, KC and especially in uh, in Alula. The first thing that I, I think it was already mentioned before, and I think it's very important. Please come and visit Alula. If you want to do business, you need to come and visit. You need to, to visit the sites. You need to be inspired by the place. You need to meet people. You need to meet people, and not only on, on, a, on a Teams, on a Zoom meeting. You need to, to meet them face to face. It's very important. The second thing is, this was also mentioned, I think, put forward your expertise, your know-how, your innovations, what you're ready to bring to the project, what is you are, you are good in, and you, 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 you think are really added value to the Alula project in your, in your, uh, in your domain. So third recommendation would be, of course, it is obvious, but it's very important to take that into account when you discuss with 30 people, and, and we, especially with Alulais, to listen to them. Listen to the Saudis, listen to their expectation, and, and show them that you're ready to adapt your offer to their expectation. Don't come with your, you know, uh, uh, your offer. It's, it's, it, it, was, it was sync in France or Europe, and this is exactly what I want to do with you. This would never work. You, you, you are strong enough with your expertise, you know how, and you can adapt it to their expectations. And they want something, they want your expertise, but with something specific to Alula or to KSA. And of course, my last recommendation would be uh, be prepared and accept, once the contract is signed, some flexibility. At the moment, in KSA, you cannot be sure that the contract will be exactly at a sign and accept it in a certain uh, uh, dimension, I would say. This will be my, f my four recommendation this for today. Is, Thank uh, you very much. This is the last word, and this last word will be flexibility. Thank you very much to Business Friends to have invited us. <laughs>